Hope you've watched all the episodes so far and have been finding them useful. Today we'll be seeing the first of the seated poses, poses in the Upavishta Stiti. Prior to this poses, we did standing poses, an entire gamut of nine poses. At this juncture, I would like to clarify the way in which we've sequenced 26 episodes. We will first be seeing standing poses, after which we see seated poses, following which forward extensions, twists, back extensions, and finally, restorative poses. I'd like to explain why we are doing this in this fashion, in this order. Standing poses offer great strength and toning to the spine and legs. As you will see in today's sitting pose, which is Dandasan, the tone and strength of the spine as well as the legs is a very important prerequisite in order to be able to do the asana perfectly, well aligned and successfully. These sitting poses create a concave back a back in which the dorsal spine is sharply engaged, the entire anterior spine is extended. Again, I'd like to emphasize on the word concave back. Usually, when a person moves to a forward extension pose, it's very common to see a dull, sunk spine. It is these sitting poses that actively create a concave spine and therefore these poses act as an intermediary for the upcoming forward bends. In this manner, we've carefully sequenced all of the 26 episodes so that it can help a student progress step by step. We will now see Dandasan. Dandasan is a staff pose. Why is it called a staff? because the leg is as firm, as straight and as stable as a staff. Also, Dandasan is the necessary prerequisite for every single forward extension. No forward extension can be done without an active and vibrant practice of Dandasan. Hence, we will first start with Dandasan today and see how to do it. We will now see how to do Dandasan. We will see three variations of the same. The first with hands by the sides of the hip. The second in the Urdhvahasta variations where the hands are raised up, Urdhvahasta Dandasan. And the third where the hands are holding the feet, Padangushta Dandasan. We will now go to the first of them for which the practitioner will have the legs in front of him bent. The bent leg position is particularly important as a Madhya Stiti or an intermediary to figure out the position of the buttock bone. Usually when you sit flat, the buttock bone comes, the buttock muscle comes as a thick layer that covers or shrouds the buttock bone. So when you bend the knees, then the buttock bone against the ground or mat becomes sharper and more evident. And therefore, the practitioner starts with the leg bent in order to detect the buttock bone. After this position, the hand is inserted underneath the buttock on the right side. The buttock muscle is separated away from the sacrum, which makes the contact of the buttock sharper than you sit on the right side. After sitting, then you adjust on the left side where the hand is again releasing the gluteus muscle pinning the buttock bone down and then you sit in such a manner that the weight is equally distributed between both the right and left sides of the buttock. 
Remember we did Tadasan earlier, where in Tadasan we talked about the equal distribution of weight on the feet. Because this is a sitting position, we look at equal distribution of weight once again, but this time on the buttock bone. In this position, the shoulders are rolled sharply back. The sternum is pumped high, that is the breast bone, the bone connecting the two breasts are, is raised nice and tall. The back rib is fully engaged towards the front ribs, then the ribs are raised high. Maintaining a tall chest, a standing spine, the legs are straightened one after the other. With the feet joined, the gap between the ankles joined, the toes joined, the shins, knees and thighs like Tadasan have to be joined as much as possible. Dandasan is the basic sitting pose like Tadasan is a standing pose. It is foundational, hence the corrections of joining the leg, raising the spine are particularly mandatory. Here, the thigh needs to be completely gripped down towards the ground. From the top of the thigh, all the way until the bottom of the thigh, the thigh needs to be held down. The thigh needs to be held down on both the knee end as well as the thigh end, the thigh that is towards the buttock. The entire surface of the back thigh must be pasted on the ground. When that happens, the calf muscle should lengthen away towards the heel such that the back of the knee is not crowded by the calf. The calf must be elongated such that the back of the knee becomes long and spacious. And therefore, with that action happening, you have to extend the hinge or the Achilles tendon at the base of the heel away as well as the inner ankle and the outer ankle. Every toe is well spread. The big toe mound should thrust forward, the heel should thrust forward, the leg itself should be a dense gripping leg against which the entire spine should raise. Raising the spine, rolling the shoulder back, the practitioner should then go from cup shaped palms to flat palms by the sides of the hip. When the palms touch, the spine should raise even more. When the palms touch, fingers touch, the thigh should grip and the spine should raise further, pressing the weight of the palm should be collected or gathered from the roll of the shoulder. Shoulder should provide the grip to the palm upon which the spine rises. This is the first variation of Dandasan with hands by the sides of the body. Having done the first variation where the palms are by the sides of the hip, we will now move to the second variation which was Urdhvahastasan. In Urdhvahastasan, the quality of Urdhvahastasan is to elongate the spine. This is very mandatory in any sitting pose because in a sitting pose, the tendency of a practitioner is to slouch and drop the spine. We will now address that rolling the shoulder back, keeping the sides of the body from the outer armpit to outer hip, keeping the sides of the body very tall, the practitioner will then get the arm in front and then raise it all the way behind the ear as in the upper arm should go behind the ear and when the arm goes back, it is natural and should be happening that the sides of the body becomes tall. But it's important to see that it's not only the side of the body, even the centre chest must raise as much as the sides of the body. During this time, it is difficult to keep the thigh down, but it is upon mental will and volition that the thigh must be gripped, calf muscle must be stretched and spread, heel should be away and the ankles should be extending. The next variation, we will move to the same will move from this position which is Padangushta Dandasan. Keeping the front of the spine tall, you just have to reach forward and hold the sides of the foot. When you reach forward to the sides of the foot, the side of the body which was elongated in Urdhvahastasan must be 
regained, re-accessed and once again stretched. When you move from Urdhvastasana itself, you should maintain the side length. Holding the hand by the side, you have to build a tall body, insert the back dorsal spine. The back spine should move in front, back ribs should move in front towards the front ribs and then the chest must be as tall as possible pulling the longest straightest arm and the tallest most elongated spine. The hands here are used to pull the little toe side of the foot back such that the femur is stabilized, the thigh is stabilized and the thigh remains strongly gripped towards the ground. These are the three variations, hands by the side, Urdhva Hastasan, in Dandasan and Padangushta Dandasan. I will now clarify some actions that you will have to pay attention to. The first one is which is the buttock bone and which is the tail bone. How to differentiate between the two. When you are sitting in a sitting asana, it is important to position yourself on the sits bone or the ischium. It is important to sit on the bones that are made for sitting. But very many times students tilt on the tail bone which should not be used for sitting. I will show you how to differentiate between the two. As mentioned in the earlier part, when we bend our leg and move the buttock muscle away from the sacrum on the right side, move the buttock muscle away from the sacrum on the left side, then you feel a sharper point of sitting, that is the sit bone. But in order to maintain the sit bone, you have to have the back ribs in and your chest tall even when you move to Dandasan. If you slouch, then you move away from the buttock bone onto the tailbone at the back. The tailbone is the root of the spine. When you do this, as you see the pelvis rounds out and you start to slouch. People who have a problem engaging the spine usually will tend to do this. That should not happen. You have to pull the back ribs in, raise the spine anteriorly up, sit on the sit bone and not slouch on the tailbone. For this, the sacrum needs to be in the body, it shouldn't slouch out of the body. The back ribs should be in the body, it should not be pulled out of the body. When you have your back ribs in and your sacrum positioned tall, you will be sitting on sharp bones, sit bones, which should not be dulled when you go into the sacrum or tailbone. The next action is about the position of the shoulder when the hands are by the sides of the hip. Usually, you'll have to keep your palms by the side of the hip and really strategically raise the anterior spine and chest up. At this position, when the spine is tall, the shoulder should move back and it is from the back of the shoulder that you extend arms, palms by the sides of the hip and raise your chest up. When the spine is still unprepared and it's not very strong, a practitioner will extend the palms down in such a manner that the shoulder will hitch up. The, when a palm, palm is cup shaped, the shoulder hitches up or when the palm is pressed, the chest will shrink leading to a shoulder being hitched up. These are wrong and compressive actions of the chest that should not be done. When you sit, you will have to pull the spine frontally upwards, stretch the chest, roll the shoulder back and it is upon this foundation that the arms are pressed. You should not move to this position where the chest shrinks and the shoulder eats into neck space. That is the wrong action. The chest should be a tall, spine should be a tall frontal face, chest should be open upon which the hands should be firmly placed. This is the right way to do the pose. In the second variation that we discussed, where we take our hands to Urdhvahastasan, there are two ways of doing it. We can take our hand in front and then raise our hand to Urdhvahastasan or like mentioned in Tadasan, we can take our hand to the side, spread our chest and from there raise to Urdhvahastasan. 
in either of these variations the side of the body as in from the side of the hip to side of the armpit going through the elbow to the outer wrist and little finger should be tall it should not be shortened or dropped so gripping the thigh down it's important to raise the spine for this while that happens and while practitioners concentrate on that many times they lift the side of the body but drop the chest at the center this happens where yes they are trying to pull the side of the body hard but they start to drop the center it's not healthy when you raise the side as well as the center of the body must equally stand tall right left and center should equally stand tall in urdhva hasta dandasan we will now look at some of the common problems that students face in the practice of dandasan and address the same using props firstly when a student is very very stiff in the hamstrings paraspinal muscles or very immobile with the spine you will see them struggling to sit straight in the struggle you will see that the leg bends the spine slouches and when they try to pick themselves up there is an immense shivering in the entire spine this shivering indicates weakness a lack of strength so the position that they go into has several defects where the spine is crushed anteriorly the organic surface of the body is very compacted compressed the legs joints of the knee are unable to open the head hangs compressing the heart region and on top of this you will see them shivering to address this entirely there is one solution to raise the height on which you are sitting i am right now sitting on the ground sitting on the ground may not be so easy for new practitioners in which case you use a higher platform like a bolster in this case so we sit on a bolster and as always separate the buttock muscles and here because the bolster is at a higher raise higher platform than the ground immediately it shifts the spine to a higher position the spine automatically starts to raise up automatically starts to lift which sitting on the ground may not offer the second advantage is because the spine is raised the legs start to slant downwards this creates a natural separation between the spine and the leg where the leg doesn't inhibit the raise of the spine and the raise of the spine doesn't pull the leg up you may use the height like a bolster but in case people are stiffer you could use even a higher platform such as a stool apart from this another difficulty that a student may face is to feel strain in the lower back especially when they move from dandasan to urdhvasta dandasan and then padangushta dandasan this strain in the back again is because of lack of alignment and tone in the spine as well as the muscles of the leg and spine to alleviate this we will start from showing the classical dandasan and progress from there onwards in classical dandasan the thighs are pressed the hands are by the side and the chest should be lifted this is the basic pose at this point you need tremendous strength to lift the spine up away from the thigh and at the same time root the thigh away from the spine there are two variations versions that i've talked about one is the spine lifting away from the thigh the second is the thigh pressing away from the spine both of them move in opposite directions when this happens sometimes you'll see students pushing the lower back pushing straining the lower back this may cause some irritation or pain or strain in the lower back to relieve this like before we use height such as a bolster as we mentioned the minute we sit on a bolster this raise gives some relief to the spine to naturally move upwards and an incline for the thigh to mat naturally move downward but apart from this a student may also open the leg 
hip width apart by hip width apart I mean that the outer hip and the outer ankle must be in line when this distance of separation is created the spinal muscles also widen therefore alleviating the spinal strain we will now talk about the aspect of students slouching in a sitting pose in a sitting pose it's common that the spine feels gravitational as if it's being dragged down but it's very important to go against gravity and lift the spine particularly because sitting poses are also most profusely used in pranayama it's important to have the spinal surface diaphragmatic surface respiratory surface open when students slouch as mentioned there is a frontal crush an organic crush frontally it's very compressed to reverse this first we'll be using two blocks these are hard blocks one on the side of the right hip one on the side of the left hip where hands are usually placed gripping the block using the block's assistance we can press down on the block and raise the spine up so the hands are used as an instrument for pushing down against which the spine is raised up this is where blocks are used as assists to raise the spine We now saw how to do dandasan and also saw various prop arrangements by which the pose could be modified or bettered. In dandasan we saw that the spine should be lifted as well as the leg should be kept down firmly. Initially a practitioner finds this very hard. If you lift the spine the legs buckle if the legs are kept down the spine buckles. This is why standing poses are done earlier because standing poses offer tremendous toning and strength to the legs and spine which is absolutely necessary for all sitting poses starting with dandasan though we call dandasan a sitting pose the legs are carefully and firmly placed upon which a tall standing like spine mounts on top of the leg dandasan is absolutely essential especially in today's time because lifestyle changes have caused us to very minimally use floor or execute floor level actions people hardly sit down these days we don't we use a table we use western lavatories we use desks so floor level usage is completely minimized when we don't go all the way up to floor level a joint which is capable of full extension and full flexion doesn't do that anymore the joints are only partially used hence floor level seated poses execute a full range joint mobility also because today's work culture demands us to sit for long hours it's important to first be very conscious of how to sit dandasan helps us with all this in the upcoming episodes we will see more asanas in the stri seated or upavishta sthiti that will help us progress with the seated poses and forward extensions thank you mm.